I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. This episode is about Poseidon. He is best known as the ancient Greek god of the sea, and in Greek art he is easily recognizable when he is holding his large trident. Like many gods, he has a chariot, but his chariot is usually pulled by a pair of hippocampus, essentially giant sea horses. Literally, though, they are shown with the head and front half of a horse and the tail of a fish. In addition to them, dolphins were also very special to Poseidon. Poseidon was very important in the general Greek religion. He had a lot of temples in the Greek colony cities of Magna Graecia in Sicily, and ancient Greek colonists who traveled across the sea to Italy honored Poseidon especially, because they believed he allowed them to get to their destination safely. But besides his links to the ocean, Poseidon also has some very clear links to dry land, which I think are actually the most interesting things about him. Bulls were sacred to Poseidon, especially on the island of Crete, but maybe even more important, though, were horses. The ancient Greeks believed Poseidon introduced horses to Greece and taught humans how to ride them. But first, let's dive in, pun intended, into what the myths say about Poseidon and how he came to rule over the sea. As it happens, way back in the earliest creation episodes, I talked very briefly, really nothing more than a sentence, about the birth of Poseidon. Poseidon was one of the children of the titans Kronos and Rhea. He was one of the middle children, and I gave the story as told by Hesiod's poem, The Theogony, about how Kronos swallowed each of his children after they were born. Now, by the time she was on her sixth child, Zeus, Rhea had had enough, and had hatched a plan to hide the baby Zeus in Crete and trick Kronos into eating a rock. Later, after spending a long period of time living in Kronos' small intestines, Poseidon was vomited back into the real world, after being rescued by his brother Zeus. That account of Poseidon's birth is pretty much followed by Apollodorus' library, written several hundred years later. However, there are hints of some added details by other ancient writers. Diodorus of Sicily, living around 60 to 30 BC, and Pausanias, a Greek writer living about 150 years later, wrote that Poseidon was not eaten by his father Kronos. Instead, he was raised in secret on the island of Rhodes, just like how Zeus was raised in Crete. The story goes that Rhea went and hid the baby Poseidon in the middle of a flock of young lambs, and then took a baby lamb back to Kronos and pretended she had given birth to that. While Kronos gobbled up the lamb back in Rhodes, Poseidon was raised by a race of mysterious creatures, called the Telkines, and I'll tell more about them in a minute. Now, when Zeus finally grew up and returned to fight Kronos, Poseidon, either in the traditional version, joined him after Kronos vomited up his remaining children, or, in this alternate version, joined Zeus after growing up in Rhodes. After that, there is the war between the Olympians and the Titans. In one of the most well-known versions of the war with the Titans, the version in Apollodorus's library, Zeus released the Cyclopses from Tartarus, and they made lightning for Zeus, and for Poseidon, they made a trident. Basically, a big pitchfork. In the less known version, though, the poet Callimachus said that Poseidon's trident was not made by the Cyclopses, and instead was made by that same strange group of beings, the Telkines, that Diodorus said raised Poseidon. So what exactly were these Telkines? Well, frustratingly, it is not clear at all. There are few references to them in ancient Greek literature, and they are short and often conflict with each other. The Telkines are sometimes described as aquatic children of the titan Oceanus. I just told you that they were said to have raised an infant Poseidon. But yet, sure enough, there are also other sources that say that they were the children of Poseidon, which doesn't make sense with the story of them raising him either. But the Telkines were also similar to the Cyclopses in some ways and made lots of treasures for the gods and statues of them. The Telkines were also said to be shapeshifters, able to control storms, and were also apparently destroyed by the gods, sometimes specifically by Apollo, by Zeus, or even by Poseidon. As you can see, it's all very confusing. For what it's worth, though, the tradition of the Telkines raising Poseidon and also creating Poseidon's trident comes from Callimachus and Diodorus of Sicily two poets who were active in the Hellenistic period of ancient Greece. So it's possible that this tradition was a Hellenistic innovation. Regardless, though, whether the Cyclopses made Poseidon's trident or some strange group called Telkines, Poseidon at least had a trident. And he used it to create things like springs, and also as a weapon. And he used it as a weapon when Zeus and his siblings fought the Titans. 
after the Olympians were victorious, the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. Poseidon had a very special role in this. He was responsible for building the bronze walls and gates that surrounded Tartarus, and kept the Titans locked away in their deep, dark, gloomy prison. And also, after the Titans were defeated, the universe was ready to be carved up among the victors. Apollodorus and Homer both tell us that Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades drew lots, and Poseidon ended up becoming the master of the seas. And that brings us to what Poseidon was doing in the mythical silver and bronze ages of Greek mythology. Poseidon's wife is Amphitrite. She is basically a mermaid, and is either a daughter of the Titan Oceanus or a daughter of Nereus. Nereus is the old man of the sea, and he is the son of Gaia, the earth, and her second husband, Pontus, the sea. So Amphitrite is from the other side of the bigger divine family that contains Titans, Olympians, and other immortals. Later sources give a short story of how Poseidon and Amphitrite ended up together. Poseidon desired her, but she fled and hid in the Atlas Mountains, which are actually located in Morocco, and for the ancient Greeks, served as basically the end of the earth. But Poseidon sent various animals to find her. Eventually, a dolphin found Amphitrite and convinced her to return and marry Poseidon. Well, she did, and according to Hesiod's Theogony, the couple lives in golden palaces located at the bottom of the sea. The poet Pindar, who lived from 518 BC to 438 BC, at the end of the archaic period of ancient Greece, mentions that Amphitrite had a golden spindle, so apparently she spent her downtime weaving and sewing deep underwater. Triton is the son of Poseidon and Amphitrite. In art, he is usually shown with half the body of a fish. In modern times, we often draw Poseidon with a fishtail or as a merman, but this is actually a mix-up and comes from Poseidon's son, Triton. Ancient Greek art always showed Poseidon as a grown man without the fishtail. Poseidon and Amphitrite also had a daughter. Her name was Chimapalia, and she was married to one of the three Hecaton Kyries, the hundred-handed, fifty-headed giants that helped the Olympians defeat the Titans in the time of creation. Besides Amphitrite, Poseidon almost became a lover of Thetis, another daughter of Nereus, like Amphitrite. As the myth goes, both Zeus and Poseidon tried to seduce Thetis, but then they became aware of a prophecy that Thetis would give birth to a son who would become greater than his father. They quickly backed off. Zeus, of course, as king of the universe, and someone who deposed his own father, was always looking out to maintain his power. But Poseidon was careful to maintain his power among the gods, too. Poseidon did, however, have children with Demeter, one of his sister goddesses, who will be the focus of an episode coming soon. Poseidon lusted for Demeter, and to escape him, she turned into a female horse and hid among a grazing herd of horses in Arcadia in southern Greece. But Poseidon saw through this disguise, and turned himself into a stallion, and ended up raping Demeter in horse form. Demeter and Poseidon ended up having two children, a girl and a boy named Arion. The boy, and possibly the girl too, were actually in the form of horses. This myth is referenced by several Greek sources. The earliest documented one is by Callimachus, sometime around 290 BC. Aspects of this myth are actually believed to be a lot older. In the time of Mycenaean Greece, Poseidon and Demeter may have actually been a more official couple. The name Poseidon comes from the Mycenaean Greek word Poseidoni. No one really knows what his name means, but there are theories that it translates to Lord or Husband of Da, and this Da would refer to Demeter whose name likely comes from Da Mater. So if that's the case, Mycenaean Greece may have had the earliest forms of Poseidon and Demeter as a couple, and they both would have had associations with land, horses, and vegetation. Although, I should mention, many linguists completely disagree with that breakdown of Poseidoni. They instead think a better translation is Master of Waters, or Born from Waters, specifically flowing or running water, like in rivers, but also maybe the sea, too. So it's possible that Poseidon was always linked to water in some way, too. Of course, it's also possible that the Mycenaean version of Poseidon was a water, horse, and earthquake god, and was still a partner of Demeter, too. Besides those children with Amphitrite and Demeter, Poseidon also had other immortal children. Most of them are aquatic deities, as you would expect for a god of the sea, but he was the father of a tribe of Cyclopses, too. Not the lightning-making ones, though. 
These cyclopses were actually one-eyed man-eating giants. They're present in the Odyssey, and they're not depicted as being particularly sophisticated. Poseidon had two more giants for children. Their names were Otis and Iphaltes. In addition to the immortals, Poseidon also had mortal lovers, too. But I don't think you can call a lot of them lovers, because as you'll hear, like with a lot of Greek gods, most of these lovers are rape victims. In the Athena episode, I talked about the Gorgon Medusa. Around 700 BC, Hesiod's Theogony just says that they had sex in a soft meadow among spring flowers. The Roman poet Ovid, though, says that Poseidon raped Medusa in a temple to Athena. Poseidon then fled away, and Athena ended up turning Medusa into a monster. Another girl, Canis, was a beautiful girl who had received multiple offers of marriage. She turned them all down, and then one day found herself walking along the seashore. At that point, Poseidon appeared and raped her. Afterwards, he offered her a wish, and she asked to be turned into a man. So Canis became Caeneus. Poseidon also made him invulnerable to weapons, so Caeneus went on to become a decorated warrior hero. And then there is Tiro, a princess of Thessaly in northern Greece. She married her uncle, but was secretly in love with a river spirit, Enipeus. Enipeus didn't return her feelings, but Poseidon, though, lusted after her. So one night, Poseidon appeared to Tiro in the shape of Enipeus and slept with her, and she ended up becoming pregnant with twins, who, when they were born, were left by her husband, uncle, to die on a mountainside. But of course, in myth, leaving babies on mountainsides almost guarantees their survival. The twins grew up to be the heroes Peleus and Neleus. In another story, though, a young woman, Amy Noni, is sent by her father to look for water. She finds a deer and throws a javelin at it, but misses. The javelin flies through the air into the brush of the forest and hits a sleeping satyr. The satyr awakes, sees Amy Noni, and lustily chases after her. But then Poseidon arrives. He chases the satyr away, saving her from being raped. But then Poseidon and Amy Nomi have sex, and Poseidon shows her the location of local springs. Later, Amy Nomi gave birth to a son, Nopleus, and he inherited from his father Poseidon a love for the sea, and became a heroic sailor. In addition to those, Poseidon had a whole bunch more sexual partners too. There's actually way too many to go into right here. But through them, he was the father of several of the most famous Greek heroes. Theseus, the hero who killed the Minotaur, was a son of Poseidon. Bellerophon, who was able to ride the winged horse Pegasus, and the hunter Orion, who I talked about in the Artemis episode, was another. So in a lot of these episodes focused on specific Olympians, you've already heard how a number of gods and goddesses traveled the earth, acquired different responsibilities, and competed in contests to become the patrons of specific cities. And a few of those contests featured Poseidon. In Corinth, the dispute was between Poseidon and the sun god Helios. This myth is not really a contest or competition. The two gods basically just had an extended argument between themselves. Eventually, Briareos, one of the Hecatonchires, those 100-handed, 50-headed giants that played such an important role in the Titanomachy, had to be called in to end the argument. Briareos ended up splitting the region, giving the Isthmus of Corinth, the skinny piece of land that connects Corinth to the rest of mainland Greece, to Poseidon. The higher cliffs that towered above the city were given to Helios. Corinth would become the site of the Ishmian Games, one of the most important athletic festivals held in ancient Greece and held to honor Poseidon. Poseidon and Hera competed to be the patron of the city of Argos. The judges in this case are the local river spirits, the spirits of the rivers Inakos, Kephisos, and Asterion. The river spirits decided to grant Argos to Hera, and Poseidon was not happy with their decision. In retribution, he caused the rivers in Argos to dry up, and making it so that they only flow after it rains. This myth was used by the ancient Greeks to explain why the rivers near Argos dried up at certain times of the year. Athena and Poseidon fought over the city of Trozen, a city that was not a major player during classical Greece, but is believed to have been important in the early period of the Mycenaeans. As the myth goes, Zeus intervened and commanded Athena and Poseidon to share the city. Nevertheless, there were a lot of sanctuaries to Poseidon in the area in and around Trozen, even in the classical Greek era. A more famous contest is the one between Athena and Poseidon for patronage of Athens. 
This myth is more clearly a contest. Athena and Poseidon both offered a gift to Athens in return for their choosing them as their patron. Athena offered the Athenians the first olive tree. Poseidon struck the Acropolis of Athens with his trident and created either a saltwater spring or, well, a cistern. The Athenians ended up choosing Athena, seeing the use, food, and fuel that could come from the olive tree. This angered Poseidon, who had a tantrum and flooded a portion of the area. So, here we have a couple myths about Poseidon's attempted patronages. I say attempted because he either loses the contests or ties them. Now, what I don't understand about these myths, though, is why those are the outcomes. To me, Poseidon is kind of getting a pretty raw deal here. He is the brother of Zeus, he probably helped win against the Titans, he controls the sea, a third of the Greek universe, he's powerful, so why is his gift to Athens, for example, pretty useless? A saltwater well? I mean, you can't even drink it. Now, I know Poseidon is the god of the sea, so maybe a saltwater well makes a little bit of sense, but the gift still seems strange because Poseidon wasn't just a god of the sea. He was also the god of horses, and wouldn't horses have made a pretty competitive choice? The losses are stranger, too, because Poseidon actually seems to be a very powerful god. Now, there aren't a whole bunch of myths that show this, but Poseidon was the one who sealed the doors that held the titans in Tartarus, so he was obviously very skilled in that regard. And there was also a tradition that Poseidon was one of several deities who was worshipped at Delphi before Apollo built his temple there. And there are also several examples within Homer's Iliad that show Poseidon as someone who takes a very active role in the lives of mortals on Earth. First, let's talk about how the walls of Troy were built. At some point, generations before the Trojan War, Poseidon and Apollo got on Zeus's bad side. We don't really know the reason why, but it's implied that they may have not followed Zeus's wishes or even plotted against him. Although, once again, there is a slightly different version. In Apollodorus's library this time, Poseidon and Apollo just went to test humans. Personally, I find the first reason more interesting, and it seems to be the original reason. Regardless, though, Poseidon and Apollo were sent there to serve the king of Troy, a man named Laomedon. Poseidon and Apollo built huge walls around Troy, and Laomedon promised payment. But Laomedon is not a good guy, and so when the walls were completed, he tells Poseidon and Apollo to take a hike. He's got nothing for them, and he refuses to give anything to them. Now, Poseidon doesn't like being cheated, and so after he and Apollo leave, he sends a sea monster to attack Troy, while Apollo sends a plague. Troy was not destroyed, though. Later, during the actual Trojan War, Zeus tells all the gods to not get involved. A few of them can't help but stir the pot, though, and look out for their favorite heroes. Poseidon himself still holds a grudge against the Trojans for what Laomedon did, so he begins helping the Greeks in their war. Eventually, Zeus becomes wise to the fact that some of the gods are intervening in the Trojan War, despite his instructions not to. He questions his wife Hera, and she swears on the river Styx, the most powerful oath a god can make, that she did not tell Poseidon to intervene, and that he is doing it because he wants to, and that he pities the Greeks because many of their soldiers are dying. So Zeus decides to send Poseidon an ultimatum. He sends Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, who, like Hermes, is a messenger for the Olympians. Iris goes to Troy and finds Poseidon. She tells him to stop helping the Greeks, or Zeus will come down from Mount Olympus and stop Poseidon himself. Well, Poseidon is not happy with this message, and he angrily gives Iris a message to take back to Zeus. He basically says something like, how dare Zeus try to stop Poseidon against his will? He speaks about how Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades each drew lots for their domains, and that they agreed the earth would be held by all. Poseidon says that Zeus should be happy with the skies and stick to telling his sons and daughters what to do on Olympus. Iris, probably not really wanting to take such an aggressive message back to Zeus, asks Poseidon if that is really the message he wants to take back to Zeus. At that point, Poseidon behaves a little more reasonably. He says he is offended, but will stop helping the Greeks for now. But Poseidon makes a warning. He says that if Zeus spares Troy in the war with the Greeks, there will be war among the gods. And with that, Poseidon dived into the sea and swam away. It seems that for all his tough talk about being a peer of Zeus, Poseidon still respects that his brother is king of the gods, but there is definitely some tension between the two. But eventually, though, the gods do become allowed to intervene in the war, and many do take opposing sides. Some of them, though, still do not want to fight each other. Apollo, for example, is on the Trojan side, opposite to Poseidon, but he says he honors his uncle and doesn't want to fight him. Apollo may actually fear Poseidon a little bit. 
With good reason, I think, because we get a really good description of Poseidon's power once he begins helping the Greeks again. When the fighting resumes, Poseidon caused earthquakes. The earth, the surrounding mountains, and both Troy and the Greek ships shook, and it created such a commotion as the gods fought each other that way down below, in the underworld, the god Hades actually became scared, and actually jumped from his throne with a scream, fearing that Poseidon would split open the earth itself, and the land of the dead would become open to the world of the living. In the story you've just heard, and in the Iliad generally, Poseidon is one of the gods that takes action and affects the lives of mortals the most. Some scholars believe that these scenes and others within the Iliad, and also various other hymns, imply the existence of some myths we are missing today. The theory is that we are missing stories about a war between the gods that ancient Greek listeners to the Iliad were already familiar with. The tension between Zeus and Poseidon suggests that they were on opposite sides. These myths aren't given in the Iliad straight up, because they weren't the focus of the story. The Iliad was mostly about the Greek heroes, and specifically about the warrior Achilles. So in myth, Poseidon was probably more important than we think, and that importance was probably also the case in the ancient Greek religion too. In Greek mythology, Zeus is the god that calls the shots. He's the king of the universe. And so, at the same time in wider Greek religion, he is the most important deity. But at earlier times in the Greek civilization, there may have been at least a more equal footing between Zeus and Poseidon. During the Mycenaean period, for example, Poseidon may have been the most important Greek god. Samples of Mycenaean writing go back to 1450 BC. That's about 700 years before the Iliad was first written down. The myths in the Iliad are undoubtedly older than Homer, but out of all the examples of Mycenaean writing we do have, Poseidoni, the Mycenaean version of Poseidon, appears more often than their name version of Zeus. Also interestingly is that his name, Poseidoni, is also accompanied with the word Vanix, or Vanix. This is the Mycenaean Greek word for king. In some of the later Greek myths, we may actually see some echoes of this Mycenaean royal role for Poseidon. In terms of names and epithets, one common one linked to Poseidon is the word Eurycreon, or Eurymedon, which means wide ruling. But we also have a myth that shows a more royal Poseidon in action. In the last episode, I talked about the Olympian smith god Hephaestus. One of the myths I talked about was how Hephaestus caught his wife Aphrodite having an affair with the war god Ares. I told you how Hephaestus booby-trapped the bedroom in his palace with especially made chains, or a net. When Aphrodite and Ares laid in the bed, they became caught in the nets and could not escape. When Hephaestus returned, he assembled the male gods together, and they had a good laugh at Ares and Aphrodite. In the story, Zeus is either unimportant or nowhere to be found. Instead, we have Poseidon, and Poseidon is the only god that doesn't laugh. He's the only male god that finds the whole thing pretty disappointing. Instead of Zeus, Poseidon is the one who acts as a mediator. He tells Hephaestus to let Ares go, and even puts his own honor and reputation on the line to make sure Ares honors Hephaestus in the future. Now, not only is Zeus the supposed king of the gods, but in this myth version, he is also the father of Aphrodite. So we have two reasons that he should be present in getting his son Ares and daughter Aphrodite out of trouble. Instead, though, we have Poseidon, acting like a king, intervening and mediating with Hephaestus, and doing so successfully. It's a different Poseidon, especially when you compare it to the myths portraying a rapist Poseidon, a contest-losing Poseidon, and a Poseidon who is jealous of his brother, the king of the universe, Zeus. So, the takeaway today is this. Something really weird was going on with Poseidon in the very early days of ancient Greece. It seems he may have been more important in the Mycenaean era, and maybe lost some of that importance to Zeus over time and that importance given to Poseidon does make some sense. On one side, he was a freshwater god, of rivers, springs, and also horses. And then on the other side, he had his strong saltwater connections, being the lord of the sea, an important god for sailors, especially important when Greeks were establishing colonies by ship throughout the Mediterranean. And then on top of that, Poseidon was the earthshaker, the god of earthquakes too. There was a lot going on for Poseidon, maybe more than what most of the surviving stories would suggest. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, get the word out and tell your friends. As always, thank you for listening.